Hey everyone, Steve here from Big Head Tech, and I'm gonna call this, I don't know if I'm gonna call it a series or not, but I'm gonna call it innovations over the last decade. And what we have today is Intel's very first six core versus AMD's very first six core versus Intel's current six core and AMD's current six core. So we have essentially a 1090T, an R5 3600, an i7-980, which is actually a Intel Xeon W3680, and we have an i5-9600K. <clears throat> and what we want to see is during the bulldozer era, which is like from second gen Intel to about seventh gen Intel, that's how long that spanned it, we saw almost nothing. We saw IPCs and a little bit of clock speed because AMD just wasn't producing anything. We all know that. So today, and this is going to be hopefully part of a series where I can look at eight cores, four cores, etc., and see who has done the best with first starting out with a particular core count and where they've been able to bring it today. The test benches were very close. Same power supply, same graphics card, same SSD, same game drive. What changes is the CPU, in one case the cooler, because the AM3, I don't have the rear mounting bracket because the guy didn't include it. And the memory, depending on the platform, I use either use 4x4, DDR3, 1333, or 4x4, or 2x8, uh, 3600 MHz, DDR4. So processor, boards, in one case the cooler, and the memory changed. And then you can see here with the AMD setup, um, very similar, just you know, with a different board and different cooler, different CPU, but generally the rest was the same. And just a quick note, with the way I had to overclock, and I'm gonna go a little bit more than that in a second, the memory was a smidget faster on this platform. It's not gonna make a big difference, what you'll see. Testing. So, high settings pretty much across the board, unless, pretty much I use mostly high, but you'll see in each test if it was high, very high ultra, but the goal was, was to take, not necessarily the CPU bottleneck out, because I want real world scenario uh, benchmarks, but in 2010, nobody ran 1440p, just wasn't really common, 1080p was still becoming popular, people were running 720p, so, that's why I didn't run 1440p, not because of the CPU bottleneck necessarily, it was kind of because of the testing. And if for the gaming benchmarks, I'm a standard suite of programs open. Uh, the only thing, uh, I think normally I don't always have GPU-Z open, but I've been doing that recently for monitoring. Assumptions, motion blur is pretty much off whenever I'm able to turn it off. 1080p across the board, no matter what, two monitors though. Precision boost overdrive was used for the GTX 1080, uh, capped out at, 2005 megahertz on the core and synthetics only had monitoring programs open disclosures this is not a perfect test this is not steve from gamers nexus benchmarking something 15 times and averaging it i actually don't know if he does that but i know he puts a lot of work into his videos these benchmarks were verified they were run multiple times make sure that there was no big outliers the older platforms seem to have bigger variances than the newer platforms, especially in World of Warcraft. 10 to 15 FPS if you're not careful, so those tests were run probably five or, I think five and six times respectively on the older platforms, uh, just to make sure the variances were good. But here's the big one. Getting my hands on a 1090T or 1100T is very difficult. So what I did was I, and here's the other thing, getting a 1366 board is also very difficult unless you get a workstation board, which is exactly what I did. So I can get an AM3 board without spending a lot of money and it can overclock. So what I did, and I know this isn't a perfect test, but I overclocked Northbridge to get the, uh, in the front side bus rather, not Northbridge, I overclocked the front side bus to get the CPU speed to about 3.708 or something like that to pretty much mimic what a 1090T would be. So why didn't I overclock the Xeon system? Well, 3.46 is as far as the board let it go. Really not much I can do about that. This has an 8-pin on this system. The Xeon board only has a 4-pin despite being a 130-watt CPU. So that was as far as that would go. Um, 
getting a 1366 board and an i7 980 would be several hundreds of dollars and just wouldn't make sense for this example and just the results i don't think really they wouldn't really favor intel they'd actually make it worse in this scenario and i'll explain later and the 9600k is the current six core the 8700k is not the current generation six core but to help fix that issue we ran tests with smt and hyper threading off to make it fair six core versus six core no extra threads now let's start cinebench now these results are pulled from my previous tests that i ran with the 1080 so they should be i'm really only going to focus on the other two if you haven't seen my r5 3600 versus i5 9600k which is at 4.6 gigahertz versus precision boost take a look at that video so we're going to focus on the nine ten year old cpus so we have the uh, w3680 i do have uh hyper threading on on these first set of benchmarks performed pretty well somewhere between like 20 30 percent ahead and multi-core uh, single core a lot closer than i expected r20 uh, only 11 points ahead and r15 a bigger gap at 10 points because it scores a lot lower i've really expected the single thread performance to be much bigger especially on r20 but who knows maybe maybe the cpus are a lot closer than we expected and they still could very much be even though the 1090t in this test did not do so well 16 point or 18.62 minutes versus 12.45 that's a pretty big difference uh smt and hyper threading would probably eat, get within about a half of that difference but it wouldn't make up the difference entirely so the multi-core performance definitely is going with intel we'll see a little bit more if that holds true without uh, or hyper threading turned on world of warcraft this test kind of surprised me with how close the single thread performance was i didn't expect more than 10 percent gap and we had about a 35 45 percent gap somewhere in that ballpark uh just under 100 versus just over 70 didn't really expect that i really expected them to be much closer but clearly intel has a big advantage here in world of warcraft for either if it's the single th single threaded performance on top of the architecture design who knows but clearly those are the results there for honor the results are a bit closer here 122 versus 102 and or excuse me almost one at 104 and a half and this is not extreme so what this is telling you is this is definitely not really too concerned about the cpu clearly these are not going to touch current gen and you are going to hit a cpu bottleneck but averaging 104 and 122 fps on max settings is, is quite good but intel definitely had about a 20 percent performance gain here rise of the tomb raider similar story uh, we're just over 88 and about 74 and a half a bit closer uh, gp might have something to do with that but what's interesting to note is previously we weren't seeing well world of warcraft was a huge increase for honor was a little bit of an increase and this game again is more is right around double double or more the division two we're looking at about 78 versus 59 so still a decent win here however they're both over 60 again 60 fps is always the preference that's what everybody wants right so with i mean granted we have a really beefy graphics card that's carrying both these processors uh, but either way um we're still looking at an intel win here uh, and um amd is a little bit lagging behind here but let's see let's turn off hyper threading and then we're going to talk a little bit more about turning off smt so we're doing that both here so when we take off hyper thread let's take a look at blender Hmm, this is kind of interesting. The gap isn't as big as I expected going from the W3680 versus the 1090T. We're at about a two minute difference when previously we're at about a six minute difference. I didn't think uh, hyper threading really made up that much. But what's interesting is despite the R5 3600 being a better multi-core CPU with, with SMT, it falls behind the i5 9600k and there's a reason for that quick sync if this was an i5 9600k f without quick sync probably would have done worse I, I believe it would have done worse in that regard 
But that is something interesting to know. But Cinebench, though, paints this in a completely different story. So the Ryzen 5 3600 pretty much runs with the i5 9600K. I consider them pretty much tied in everything. Like single core, they're real close. Multi-core, they're real close. So they're pretty much tied there. Well, what's interesting is the 1090T wins out in R20, slightly loses it out in R15 and multi-core, and then single thread was pretty much the same. We're not going to spend much time on this slide. This slide, in my opinion, is irrelevant, and that is because when I've ran these tests two, three times or so on some of these games, I didn't get really anything more than margin of error from the previous tests. So there's really, the tests are there, but if you look at each individual test, and I'm, I'm not gonna put on, it's gonna be a lot to read. Long story short, SMT and hyperthreading do not help either scenario. So we're just gonna show you these, so you can kind of look at them, stop it if you want to take a closer look and compare them, but there's really nothing interesting to see here. But this is interesting, and this is conclusion time. When you take AMD's original six core, which only had six physical processors, no, no additional threads, and their current six core, which has six cores and 12 threads. In synthetics, we saw a 331 increase in performance. So that's 3.31 times increase, which is huge. Going from 18 minutes, 18, almost 19 minutes on Blender to like four and a quarter minutes on Blender is absolutely huge. Intel saw an increase, but giving up those that six extra threads definitely didn't see as much of an increase uh, there, only 184%. But this is why I did with SMT and hyper threading off because I really don't want people to say, well, the 8700K has hyper threading, blah, blah, blah. So this is a fair comparison. And even so, uh, AMD, uh, even with SMT off, still actually outpaced Intel by a few percentage points. So that really goes to tell you that uh, in that regard, it's not, uh, it's still pretty fair, I, I think, that they both have increased in total performance from a synthetic standpoint pretty well evenly there now here's the one that really is going to be interested and that's gaming and with s17 hyper not a factor here keep that in mind is that i don't have this chart up but approximately for every one frame intel is putting out in 2010 amd is putting out 0.75 frames so about 25 percent behind but AMD has increased their gaming performance by 210% versus 167%. Hence why they're pretty much even in 2019. And that goes to tell me that while AMD started further back, they have, they even went further backwards with Bulldozer. I don't have Bulldozer results and I'd be interested. If you're interested in seeing those, leave a comment. I, I can easily, this is named 3 plus board. I actually have a, right here, I have an 83... I think it's an 8320 here. 8320, 8350, so I'm an eight core. I can get a six core. So if you're interested, uh, maybe we'll throw it in there, but I'm pretty confident that a six core FX like 6100, for example, would be worse off than this. So AMD went from behind to really bad to tying Intel, and Intel went good, better, and where they're at today. So AMD in three, so they start with a 14, 12, 12 plus, and now seven nanometer in the three years. They have made so many strides from their, their last decent processor to the Ryzen 1, now to the Ryzen 3, 3000 series. And that's really what, it, what this video is about, is not necessarily how was everything in 2010, but how have these companies overcome the challenges and get to where they are today. And I gotta get my hat off the AMD. They've done absolutely wonderful work with Ryzen. However, it is AMD's fault that Intel didn't innovate because they had no reason to. They had the lead in 2010. They had strengthened the lead after that. And then it's just in 2019. Literally, Ryzen 3000 is when, it, when Intel actually now is not the best processor out there. Technically, 9900K might be the best gaming processor by slim margin, but that has to do with gaming optimization more than anything else. So that's that. So, if you liked the video, hit the like button, leave a comment, get subscribed, dislike if you dislike. Uh, I have a Patreon page, you can donate. I'm gonna try to keep up on that as well. Those proceeds are gonna go to doing more projects like this. If you wanna see the evolution of the four core, evolution of the eight core, and I'm gonna put an asterisk there because the, the earliest 
uh, eight core CPU from Intel is very expensive. It's on an LGA uh, X99 platform, uh, or uh, that'd be LGA 2011. And that's just not gonna be easy to get, but if this is popular enough, I'll do it. But Evolution, the quad core should be easy, so let me know if you're interested in that. Um, if you wanna buy anything modern, I'll list that in the description below. But as always, this is Steve from Big Head Tech, and I'll see you all later on down the road.